no idea. <laughs> Maybe scientists. They may have a source, but I don't have enough knowledge to actually answer the question. Where do they come from? Uh, I don't know if, do they have to come from somewhere? I don't know. Uh, I think once you have certain physical entities, and I think they, uh, uh, they bring into motion certain laws that govern them. In a sense, I know it's, uh, it's chicken and egg. Did the laws come in first? It's really hard to, to actually think about where everything came from. Uh, and give like one, just one answer. God. I guess they just kind of came from the physical world. I, I, I don't really know, to be honest. I don't know. I don't think I'd be able to, to, to say where they came from, but I, I don't think they came from a God. I think they were just, you know, it's just science. Hmm. That's another question That's that another. We, we'll have to explore. That's true. I don't know, you would see a pen fall down and you would know that gravity pulls it down. I don't think it was really created by anything or anyone in particular. I think it just kind of, it just is. I don't know. I never thought about that. I don't know where they came from, but like anything else, it started. Where did they came from? Well, rather than coming from, I think those are just something that are. I don't think they were created. Um, I don't think they were written down by by some some um, inventor. Maybe ask. Professor Brian Cox, he can answer that one, I think. <laughs> we should ask him. <laughs>
by a member of parliament called Margaret Thatcher. Some of you may have heard of her. And the conjunction of these two events, uh, one religious and one scientific, encapsulates my intellectual journey through my lifetime. Now, as uh, Stephen already remarked, unlike the other speakers in this series, I'm not a conventionally religious person. I don't belong to any religious organization, but I do care very deeply about the foundational issues that are at the heart of the scientific endeavor and the religious endeavor. I'm director of this thing called the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. And we sit around, we worry about things like why does the universe exist? How did life begin? Time travel, space travel, the destiny of mankind, and that's just in the mornings. So it's part of my job really to ponder those big questions of existence. Our motto is confronting the big questions. So I'm coming at the subject matter this evening from the standpoint of a scientist. I like to say I was born a physicist. Certainly from the earliest age growing up in post-war London, which was really boring, I became deeply fascinated by atoms and stars and magnetic fields and electric circuits and all of those sort of seemingly magical things we see around us. I remember asking my father at the age of about eight whether space goes on forever. Uh, he answered yes, by the way. Uh, may not have been right. When I was 14, I decided to build a telescope. And a few years later, I uh, not only built a bigger telescope, but ground the mirror myself. I did this in the kitchen. My parents uh, were, were really very tolerant of this. I made an awful mess. I don't suppose many people here have ground their own telescope mirror, uh, but believe me, it's, it's hard work and uh, extremely sort of grubby uh, experience. And then I erected this instrument in the back garden. It looked like an artillery piece. I think the neighbors uh, thought I was totally mad. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was clear from a pretty early age that I was going to make a career in theoretical physics with a, a specialism in astrophysics. Now, in the sixth form, I took a fancy to a young lady named Lindsay, and she was studying just art subjects, so uh, we would never share a class together, but we did meet from time to time in the school library where we went to do our homework. And I remember her sitting opposite me one day as I was scribbling my way through some calculation, and she appeared uh, curious, and she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm uh, working out the range of a ball uh, thrown up an inclined plane. And she looked very puzzled and she said, but how can you do that by writing things on bits of paper? And at the time, I remember thinking, silly girl, you know, what a, uh, this is my homework, it had to make sense. But actually what she was asking was something really very profound. What I'd learned, of course, from my uh, physics lessons is that the motion of all bodies in the universe are subject to laws. Laws first worked out by Isaac Newton in the 17th century. And it bothered me uh, that the, these laws, if they apply to everything, would also apply to the atoms in my brain. And if my brain atoms are going to do what atoms got to do, what then of free will? How could I have free will in a universe that is governed by fixed deterministic laws. Well, I raised this conundrum in the local church youth club, uh, where this was in Hampstead Garden suburb, where we had a discussion group moderated by the curate. Now, I have to say that I uh, attended this youth club not so much for spiritual enlightenment, but more the opportunity to chat up a few girls. You see there's a theme emerging here. Um, anyway, the poor fellow could offer little in the way of help. So I went and read a book called Honest to God by John Robinson, uh, the outspoken uh, Bishop of Woolwich, uh, in which he boldly re-examined the basic tenets of Christianity. But I'm afraid I came away none the wiser. Uh, and it was clear that if I really wanted to understand these sorts of questions, like free will and determinism, I would have to uh, make a career in theoretical physics. So the die was cast. Well, a few years after that, I found myself working 
at Cambridge University at the Institute of Theoretical Astronomy. I was there as a postdoctoral assistant to uh, Fred Hoyle, the uh, famous British cosmologist. And I was working on some pretty fundamental questions, such as how did the universe come to exist and what makes the past different from the future? So these profound questions have for centuries squarely been in the subject of religion, but by the 20th century, they were also amenable to scientific inquiry. In Cambridge, I found I could use mathematics to discover momentous things, such as what happened inside black holes or how an expanding universe can create particles. And just down the corridor from me, uh, Stephen Hawking, who in those days was just the lad in the wheelchair, uh, before he became a celebrity, uh, he was working on very much the same sort of problems and we became lifelong colleagues and friends. I moved from there in 1972 to King's College in London to the Mathematics Department where I worked with a student named Tim Bunch. We applied the laws of quantum physics to the first split second of the universe, a period now known as the inflationary phase. Our equations predicted that the newborn universe uh, should slightly crinkle up. And about 10 years later, a satellite discovered that sure enough, it did. The Big Bang was hot, and the fading afterglow of that originating event bathes the universe today. And slight variations in the temperature of that afterglow betray the existence of primordial irregularities in the density of material. The, the, when the Big Bang went bang, it coughed out material in an almost but not completely smooth condition. And that's a good thing because the denser regions just immediately after the Big Bang became the seeds of the large scale structure of the universe, the galaxies, and from the galaxies, the stars and then planets, and in the case of Earth at least, life and humanity. And so I find it awesome that these simple equations that we have worked with can capture such a profound truth of this large-scale structure of the universe without which uh, we simply wouldn't be here today. But there's much more. There's more to it than just uh, being able to apply these equations. You have to wonder whence comes this astounding ability of mathematics to uncover the deepest secrets of the universe. Does nature have to be like this? Well, you couldn't be a scientist without believing that in some sense uh, nature is ordered, and it's not only ordered, but it is at least in part intelligible to us. So it's rational and it's comprehensible. But this raises two challenging questions that have troubled me my whole life. First, what is the source of this mathematical order in nature? And secondly, how come we humble human beings can understand it so profitably? So then, let me turn to these laws. What are they? Where do they come from? Well, we've already had the wisdom of some of the local residents on those subjects. The early scientists such as Galileo and Newton were in no doubt that the laws of physics were the product of the divine intellect. Spinoza, for example, wrote uh, the following words in 1670 that captures it very well. Uh, and I quote, Now, as nothing is necessarily true, save only by divine decree, it is plain that the universal laws of nature are decrees of God, following from the necessity and perfection of the divine nature. Nature, therefore, always observes laws and rules which involves eternal necessity and truth, and therefore she keeps a fixed and immutable order. Well, of course, science didn't spring ready-made into the minds of Newton and his colleagues. They were strongly influenced by Greek philosophy. Most ancient cultures were aware that the universe isn't totally haphazard, that there is a definite order in nature. The Greeks uh, taught that this order could be understood by the application of human reasoning. The physical existence is not absurd, uh, but rational and logical, and therefore, uh, in principle, intelligible to us. Now, Greek philosophy got merged with monotheism in medieval Europe, and what we call science was really the product of that marriage. 
Early physicists such as Galileo and Newton believed that in doing science, they were glimpsing the mind of God and uncovering through experiment and mathematical exploration the imprint of God's rational plan in the physical world. And this became a subject known as natural theology. In the ensuing centuries, uh, God got killed off in science, uh, so the laws were left unexplained, free-floating, so to speak. Belief in a law-giving God got replaced by belief in the laws themselves. So the reliability and dependability of nature's immutable mathematical order became the founding belief of the scientist. But a problem lurks here. The entire scientific enterprise is based on the assumption that all natural phenomena, including the origin of the universe in a Big Bang, can in principle be explained using the laws of physics. But what explains the laws? Where do the laws of physics come from? Symbolic only? I don't expect you to solve the equation in the lecture. Perhaps there's no explanation. Perhaps the laws exist reasonlessly. Perhaps there's no reason at all for these particular laws, or indeed any laws. If that's the case, then the entire rational order of the universe is a sham that terminates either in absurdity or impenetrable mystery. Well, I have to say that I am not happy to simply accept the wonderful order of the universe as a brute fact. I want to know why it is as it is. And I'm in good company. Einstein once said that the thing that most interested him is whether God had any choice in the nature of his creation. Now, Einstein wasn't conventionally religious, but like many scientists, myself included, he professed what he called a sort of cosmic religious feeling. Crucially, he recognized that the universe could have been otherwise. It may have been ordered differently, or it may not have been ordered at all. Indeed, there's no particular reason why there has to be any universe. I want to trace time back to the beginning, uh, back to that Big Bang, and return to the theme of the laws. Were they stamped on the universe from the get-go, like the maker's mark? Back in my own student days, which was many decades ago, the Big Bang was widely supposed to be the origin of time as well as space, and of course matter too, which is to say that time did not exist before the Big Bang. You may be confused by that, but it's actually a very old idea. St. Augustine of Hippo wrote that the world was made with time and not in time. And this was to counter the taunts of his pagan detractors who asked, what was your God doing? before he made the universe. And the standard answer was, busy making hell for the likes of you. <laughs> but by declaring that time is part of the physical universe and therefore part of God's creation, Augustine was able to draw the sting of that taunt. If God exists outside of time altogether, then we would say God transcends time. Well, what about those free floating laws? Do they transcend time as well? Or do they come into being at the moment of the cosmic birth, as we briefly saw a moment ago? Well, only if the laws transcend the universe can they be used to explain how the universe came to exist. So many of my colleagues say the origin of the universe from nothing can be explained with the laws of physics. That's only true if the laws of physics, in some sense, have an independent existence. Otherwise, we cannot appeal to them uh, to bring the universe into being. So that's a really important point. Well, now, these days, there's a different cosmological model that's become fashionable. Uh, it's based on the idea that if the Big Bang was a natural event, then surely it could happen again and again and again. And so one's led to the possibility of bangs going off all over the place, scattered throughout space and time. It's a model that's sometimes called the multiverse. So any given universe like ours might have a beginning and a middle and presumably an end, but the entire multiverse, the assemblage of all of these universes, would be eternal. And what we've all along been calling the universe is in fact just an infinitesimal fragment of this vast and more elaborate system, this assemblage. 
But for this scheme to work, the all-encompassing multiverse needs to have its own laws. For example, to provide a mechanism to create all those bubble universes, a universe-creating mechanism. Most physicists don't think we make much progress with answering these weighty questions uh, until we have a complete unified theory, a theory in which all the laws of physics are merged into a single mathematical super law in which nature is revealed in its glorious, coherent totality. And during my career, many of my colleagues have become fixated by the promise of that final unification. It was the notion of an underlying final theory that led Stephen Hawking to pen the famous words at the end of his book, A Brief History of Time. And I quote, if we do discover a complete theory, it should in time be understandable in broad outline by everyone, not just a few scientists. Then we shall all, philosophers, scientists, and just ordinary people, be able to take part in the discussion of why it is that we and the universe exist. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would truly know the mind of God. However, even if we figure out a final super law, captured as many of my colleagues hope in a succinct mathematical expression you could wear on your T-shirt, it would still need explaining. It's easy enough to write down equations. I do it all the time. There's no limit to how many equations you could write down. But of course, only a handful of special equations, perhaps just one super equation, describe the real universe. How is this charmed set chosen? This is the old philosophical problem of what exists. Of all the things we can imagine, only a tiny, tiny fraction actually exist. Atoms, stars, and elephants exist, but as far as I know, eight-dimensional pink centaurs don't. A gravitational force obeying an inverse square law exists, but a gravitational inverse cube law doesn't. So who or what gets to decide which things are merely possible, but non-existent, and which are not only possible, actually real. Who or what gets to pick out whether it's this super law or that super law that is the one? Now, there's a famous parable that illustrates the issue we're up against here. You've probably heard it. A clever <coughs> professor, cleverer than me, uh, was giving a lecture about the universe when a woman at the back stands up and says, your theories are all nonsense. I know how the universe is put together. Do tell us, replies the professor. Well, says the woman, the Earth is resting on the back of an elephant that is standing on the back of a turtle. Whereupon the professor counters, and what, may I ask, is the turtle standing on? The woman becomes very animated and replies, you may be a very clever young man, but you can't fool me. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, so it is with all attempts to find an ultimate explanation for existence. The buck or the turtle has to stop somewhere, either with an unexplained god or an unexplained super law, Douglas Adams 42, or something we simply haven't thought of yet. Science and religion are both founded on an uncritical acceptance of some form of unexplained ground, a sort of levitating super turtle that exists naturally without support. Now, life isn't the inevitable outcome of the laws of physics. In fact, it turns out to be a damn close-run thing, as the Duke of Wellington might have expressed it. The existence of life, and by implication, conscious beings like ourselves, looks like it's balanced on a knife edge. Just because the universe permits life doesn't, of course, mean it's bound to arise. In fact, we have no idea whether life on Earth emerged from a dream run of bizarre chemical flukes, in which case it might well be we're alone in the universe, or whether it pops up readily and that the universe is teeming with it. It was still very much in the dark about how non-life turned into life. The physicist Steve Weinberg is famous for his plaintive cry, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. My own research suggests something quite different. 
the very foundation of science, as I've been at pains to point out, is built on the assumption that the universe evolves according to a coherent scheme of things, a mathematical scheme, in fact, which shows that nature is not arbitrary or absurd or pointless. It's about something. And it's here that I would like to briefly address the second of the two things that have puzzled me all my life. How can human beings come to understand the world through science and mathematics? Einstein wrote about this too. He said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. For me, the magic of science is that we can understand at least part of it, perhaps in principle all of it, using the scientific method of inquiry. It's utterly astonishing that we human beings can do this. Why should the rules on which the universe runs be accessible to humans? And the mystery is all the greater when one takes into account the cryptic character of the laws of nature. When Newton saw the apple fall, about 50 miles away from here, in fact, he saw a falling apple. He didn't see a set of differential equations that link the motion of the apple to the motion of the moon and planets. The mathematical laws that underlie physical phenomena like falling apples are not apparent to us from direct observation. They have to be painstakingly extracted from nature by arcane procedures like a laboratory experiment and mathematical analysis. And that requires a lot of labor. I believe that science, if we're brave enough to embrace it, offers the most reliable path to knowledge about what is happening in the physical world. Over the years, I've enjoyed many fruitful discussions with theologians on science and religion, and I've been impressed by the open-mindedness of theologians to embrace the conclusions of modern science. Yet the general public, I think, still has this belief that uh, every scientific discovery is somehow threatening to religion. The picture I've outlined tonight is really very different. It's one in which science reveals a universe that is coherent, rational, elegant, and harmonious, an expression of a deep and purposeful scheme of things. That vision may not return us to the center of the universe, but it doesn't make us irrelevant either. A universe in which the emergence of life, consciousness, and above all, comprehension, is fundamental to its workings, is a universe in which we can truly feel at home. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention.